Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's talk from History in Indoors. Um, today is um, an auspicious day for History in Indoors because this is our 100th talk, and so it's my pleasure to um, introduce our speaker for tonight's talk. This talk is will be available on YouTube immediately after. And so if you have to dip in or dip out, you can always catch up by going on to our YouTube channel. And all our talks are available on YouTube. Um, you can also go to our History Indoors website and um, access talks there as well. Um, today's talk is the third of four talks given by Mike O'Keefe concerning code breakers and warfare, Bletchley Park. Uh, Mike is a PhD student at the University of Essex and he's it with the Department of History and his area of research is um, the working lives of women in Merseyside from in the First World War and the interwar period. Um, as I said, today is the third of four talks. Previously, Mike's spoken to us about code breaking and warfare in the First World War. And then his second talk was Enigma, the International Story. And if you haven't seen those, um, you can catch up through YouTube and via the website. We will be having a Q&A session after Mike's talk. So if you've got any questions, please just post them in the comment box and um, We'll catch up with them at the end of the meeting. So um, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Mike and, um, and enjoy. I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you, Mike. OK, thank, thanks very much, Josh. And welcome, everyone, to this uh, talk on code breaking and warfare. And um, I've probably come to the second most talked about topic when uh, it comes to uh, this particular subject. Uh, if, Enig if Enigma is in most people's minds, then Bletchley Park is probably up there with it. Uh, now, I've covered quite a lot of what I wanted to say about Enigma, but I'm going to uh, talk a, a little bit more about it tonight um, because I want to, I'm going to be concentrating on some of the key people who were involved in Bletchley Park and their achievements. Uh, <clears throat> um, and, but one of the most, imp what I think is probably the greatest achievement of uh, um, at Bletchley Park um, will be discussed and I'll be discussing tonight. And that wasn't Enigma, in fact. Um, <clears throat> um, so I will be talking a little bit more about Alan Turing um, I've said a bit about him in my last talk, but I haven't really given you very much in terms of biographical detail. So I'm going to um, say a little bit about him and also uh, Gordon Welshman, who um, also, I've also mentioned, and a guy called Dilly Knox. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but today I really want to concentrate on what I think uh, were the heroes of Bletchley Park. Um, and there weren't just heroes, there were many women working at Bletchley Park. In fact, two thirds of, by, by 1945, two thirds of the people working in Bletchley Park were, were women. And a number of them were also code breakers. Um, so I'll be talking about two of these heroines as well today. <clears throat> um, and perhaps one important thing to mention at this point is that while the majority of women at Bletchley Park, uh, um, sorry, the majority of people were at Bletchley Park were women. Um, they were mostly in support roles. Uh, but the women I'm talking about today were exceptional as code breakers and they were hugely important. But they never rose to managerial positions. 
um, perhaps as one of the ladies biographers points out, this was par for the, the period um, that I'm talking about. But so far, I have not really talked about Bletchley Park itself, how it was chosen uh, to be a location for its activities. Um, and um, so the structure of this talk, if I can just move on to the next slide, will be um, a little bit about the history of Bletchley Park, um, the development of um, Ultra, which I'll explain, and the spe special relationship with the United States of America. So then we'll go on to these key figures I've just been mentioning, in including the people who actually ran Bletchley Park, um, Alistair Denniston and Edward Travis. And then I will start to go through some of the critical figures that helped to break strategic codes. As I say, Alan Turing, Gordon Welshman, and the breaking of what was called the Abwa, Ab were enigma, uh, which is Dilly Knox, Mavis Lever, and Margaret Rock. And then Mavis Lever also made a, a, another breakthrough with the Italian enigma. And then we get on to, I think, the, the greatest um, um, part of the, uh, the, the Bletchley Park story. I, I'm going to introduce you to a guy called John, John Tiltman, who um, is really the forgotten genius of um, uh, of uh, Bletchley Park, and then um, the uh, the big breakthrough in terms of the Lorenz teleprinter machine um, and the work carried out by John Tiltman, Bill Tut, Max Newman, Ralph Tester, and I can't really see that on my slide. Um, the last last one. Um, it should say, oh, Tony Flowers, I think it should say. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of um, about Bletchley Park itself. Now, as the Second World War was approaching, the head of MI6, which was responsible for the government um, code and cipher school, um, uh, became worried that the impact of bombing in London would re destroy the various intelligence activities. And a search was started to look for a site that would be less risky from aerial attack. Um, the site would need to be relatively close to, to London um, <clears throat> uh, and be connected to the railway for ease of traveling uh, backwards and forth, forth from the capital. Um, <clears throat> now, Bletchley Park uh, had, was um, bought by a property developer and so, and um, this property developer did was intending to demolish the, the property um, uh, for a housing development. Um, but um, Sinclair decided that um, uh, he, he would try and buy the property quickly because uh, he thought it was a, a ideal for um, uh, the, the uh, government code and cipher school, as I say. Now, Bletchley was a railway town and the station was right adjacent to the Bletchley estate. Um, and so this was, became the, um, the ideal location. Um, now, an attempt was, so he bought it in 1938 um, and, um, and an attempt to relocate some of the staff to Bletchley Park was made that year. Uh, and this was actually known as Captain Ridley's shooting party to disguise the real nature of the work going on there. Um, but that uh, uh, wasn't that well planned. And uh, during 1939, with war imminent, a better planned relocation took place. And this is when the real work at Bletchley Park started. Um, now, I'm going to come on to the people in a minute, but I just want to talk about two things that are important in terms of what we might call the products of the work at Bletchley Park. <clears throat> the first uh, is that Bletchley Park developed a system um, for providing names for various activities. So, for example, anything to do with naval engagement was known as fish or shark, for ex as, as one example. Now, of all the names associated with Bletchley Park, perhaps the most important is that of Ultra. This was the name given to the, out, uh, the output of intelligence gathered at the park. So, for example, ultra-intelligence informed battle planning and strategies. 
The second output, which is worthy of note, was the development of the special relationship with the United States of America. This was and continues to be more about the sharing of intelligence rather than necessarily political special relationship, which we hear about so much in the media. <clears throat> now, this special relationship did uh, um, developed um, uh, in 1941 prior to Pearl Harbor and U.S. entry into the war at the end of uh, in in the end of that year. So let's start looking at uh, some of the key people now. Um, now this guy, Alistair Denniston, I've mentioned to you, I mentioned him to you before. He was the um, head of the um, Government Code and Cipher School from its inception in 1919 um, uh, until 1942. Um, but longevity doesn't necessarily count for anything really, and circumstances can change as they did in October 1941. Uh, when Alan Turing, Gordon Welshman and two others wrote to Churchill complaining about the circumstances at Bletchley Park in terms of insufficient staff and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and despite all his achievements at Bletchley, uh, uh, at, in the Government Code and Cypher School and, and those at Bletchley Park, um, uh, the, the uh, organization was reorganized and he became deputy director and was moved to London and his then deputy Edward Travers remained at Bletchley Park um, and um, became the uh, de facto leader <clears throat> and so let's move on to him this is Edward Travers um, now just a little bit about about him he was educated in uh, Blackheath. He joined the Royal Navy in 1906. Um, and he was in charge of um, the Government Code and Cipher School um, in 1925 and was made deputy to Alistair Dayston, Denniston. Um, and when he replaced Denniston at uh, Bletchley Park in 1942, um, he really reorganized the whole business and it's really down to the, his organization that we can um, thank for some of the major achievements um, at, 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 at Bletchley. <clears throat> so let's move on to um, Alan Turing, who most people will know, know and heard about. Um, <clears throat> Uh, now, Alan Turing was born in 1912, um, but uh, despite some difficulties at school, he showed considerable acumen when it came to mathematics. After school, he attended King's College, Cambridge between 1931 and 1934 and graduated with a first class degree. At the age of 22, he was elected as a fellow of the college. And in 1936, he published a paper um, and um, apologies for my pronunciation on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungs problem. The latter means decision problem in English. Um, and this forms the basis even today on the theory of computation. And as part of the work he did, he developed um, a theoretical mathematical uh, model um, which became known as a Turing machine. Um, and the, what the picture you can see here is a physical machine model, um, uh, whereas the um, paper that um, Turing wrote um, was um, a, a, a theoretical one. Um, and in this physical machine, um, as I say, the, there's limitations to it because a true Turing machine would have unlimited tape on both sides, evidently. And now I don't understand the technicalities behind that, uh, but, but that's the um, uh, situation. <clears throat> um, now, as you, um, uh, sorry, just going back to between 1936 and 1938, he studied at Princeton University. Um, in the US where he ob obtained his PhD and he returned to the UK in 1938. Now 
uh, despite what I've said about Denniston, um, in, nine, in January 1939, he was recruited um, by Denniston uh, alongside another mathematician. Um, Denniston, if you remember last time, had been impressed by the Polish experience. So he decided to appoint mathematicians to help solve complex codes. And we all know what uh, Alan Turing went on to do in terms of um, helping solve the Enigma problem. Um, Turing was also ahead of Hus 8, which dealt with the German naval Enigma. Um, and I'll, I'm going to come on to the building of the bomb in a second, um, which helped process the vast quantities of Enigma data. <clears throat> ah, sorry, these are slightly out of order. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm going to come back to the bomb in a second. So Gordon Welshman was another Denniston appointee. Now, you may, despite what, what, what I was saying earlier about um, the letter that Turing and Welshman wrote to Churchill, it's slightly ironic that, um, that um, uh, both uh, Turing and Welshman were appointed by Denniston. Uh, now, Welshman was brought into um, uh, Bletchley Park uh, at the outbreak of war. war. He was another mathematical genius who studied at Trinity College, Cambridge. He, become, he became research fellow in mathematics at Sydney College, Cambridge in 1932. Uh, and much of his work at Bletchley Park was in what was called traffic analysis of German communications. This revealed a considerable amount of about how the the enemy organized itself and he became head of hut 6 at bletchley park which was responsible break, for breaking the german army and air force enigmas now um now turing realized that if traffic analysis could be used to predict the text of some parts of the enciphered messages then a machine uh, could then be used to test at high speed whether there were any possible settings of the wheels which translated the enciphered characters into the deduced characters. <clears throat> More importantly, using his mathematical skills, he showed that it was far quicker to pr prove that a transformation from ciphered to deducted text precluded a vast number of possible wheel combinations and starting positions. And hence, we go back to the bomb. Now, the, in 1939, the only technology available for retrieving electrical connections from rapidly changing drum positions was to use small wire brushes on the drums to make connections with think, fixed contacts on a test plate. Uh, this was proven technology from punch card equipment. High-speed relays were initially the only reliable devices for sensing the voltages on the interconnections. And the British Tabulating Machine Company uh, had designed and the um, the and uh, and built the test plate. Um, <clears throat> and the project now, uh, which became known as the bomb, came under the direction of somebody called H. H. Keen. Um, and the machine known as Victory was completed by March 1940 and delivered to Bletchley Park. It was first installed in one end of what was now called Hut 1. <clears throat> um, but the first results uh, of using the machine weren't very, very, very encouraging. The difficulties in finding cribs meant that me when a menu was constructed between intercepted and ciphered text and a crib, it usually did not have enough loops to provide a good rejection and therefore a large number of incorrect stops resulted. I'm sorry if this is all a bit technical. So Gordon Welshman came up with the idea of a diagonal board. And this is a, a picture that I took, which is now at the National Museum of Computing, which is uh, adjacent to the Bletchley Park Museum um, and is, is well worth a visit, which I'll mention a bit later. Um, and you can see the complexity um, of the wiring system here. <clears throat> and the, 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 um, uh, how, how this worked evidently was um, that um, the Enigma machine used um, 
uh, what we call stacker, stackers. A stacker is a device we're port putting into a main socket in order to allow an electric current to flow. So if B is stackered to G, then G is also stackered to B. And this is how the diagonal board um, uh, came about, uh, or that, that, that's how it was uh, designed. And what it did was greatly contribute to the voltage flow around the network of wires in, and opened out Enigma due to the extra con connectivity that it provided. Um, and this increased the rejection of drum positions, which did not satisfy the menu. Now, the, the, this is when the bomb really started to work. Um, and both Turing and Welshman need to be congratulated for that. So I, w I won't say any more about the main part of Enigma, but I want to talk about one Enigma machine in particular in a, in a moment. But I'm next going to talk about this man who I've also mentioned previously, uh, a guy called Dilly Knox. <clears throat> now, Dilly Knox was born in 1884 and was educated um, at uh, King's College, Cambridge, and he specialised in classics uh, and was appointed as a master at Cambridge in 1909. <clears throat> now, Dilly Knox also worked in Room 40, which I mentioned at the, the, um, in my first talk. Um, <clears throat> um, but he was a, a bit of an eccentric and even uh, forgot to invite his brothers uh, to his wedding, for example. Now, his um, cryptoanalytic method was known as rodding. Now, rods were a set of 26 rods made up from the individual rows of a rod square table. And each rod um, was, uh, would be, or each set would be required for each of the rotors in, in the Enigma machine. Um, and um, this he, he developed in the mid 1930s, and it um, enabled him to um, work out um, the messages that were being used during the Spanish Civil War. Um, <clears throat> and um, he, he he worked with um, uh, the French civil, French services as uh, French secret service as well. If you, if you recall from my last talk, because he um, uh, and and, um, and and met um, the Polish contingent as well. <clears throat> um, he also mentored Alan Turing when the latter first came to Bletchley Park, um, and um, he was in charge of the team that. I'm going to come on to talk about in terms of the Italian Enigma machine. But arguably his greatest achievement was the solution of what is called the German Abwehr cipher. And um, he became chief cryptographer at Bletchley Park uh, before John Tiltman. Um, unfortunately, he was quite ill at the beginning of the Second World War. He died in 1943. From, from cancer. Um, now, um, he had two assistants, two female assistants, um, which, which I, I, need, I need to, to mention. Um, um, these are uh, Mavis Lever, uh, later Mavis uh, Beatty, and, and Margaret Rock. Now, Margaret Rock was uh, born in 1903, um, raised in Hammersmith in, in London. Um, and she had attended um, schools in Middlesex, um, and her father was uh, served in the Royal Navy as a surgeon um, in the latter part of the 19th century. <clears throat> um, and her, her father would send letters to his children frequently. Um, now, Rock um, went on to attend... Um, uh, the school in Portsmouth after the family had moved there. Um, and her father was um, uh, sank, uh, died when uh, his ship sank off the coast of Ireland, having struck two main, uh, mines laid by um, a German U-boat in the First World War. But uh, the letters that her father had sent her encouraged her to keep up with her studies and to be successful in the future. 
um, and in 1919 she passed the London General School exam um, and during high school received honours in the classes of French, maths and music and she went on to Bedford College, University of London where she got her degree in 1921. Now, after college, Rock was employed as a statistician by the National Association of Manufacturers, and she when she was able to predict the economic market and how different businesses and companies would respond to the market. And at the beginning of World War II, um, um, Margaret and her mother were evacuated um, to uh, to Cranley in Surrey. She quit her old job wanting a career in a time when the women's role was primarily to be the wife and stay-at-home mother. She was then recruited to a new job at Bletchley Park in April 1940. And initially she worked for the head of MI6 um, and then she trained and worked alongside other mathematicians and professors and went to work for Dilly Knox. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> and she worked um, closely with um, Mavis Lever on, on the same projects. Now, while working for Dilly Knox, she became the most senior cryptographer. Um, and she and Knox liked to employ women because they believed they had great skills with cryptography work. And he considered Margaret to be the fourth or fifth best in the whole enigma, of the whole Enigma staff in terms of code breaking. And she did specialize in German and Russian codes. Sorry, I have, should have moved on to a picture of Margaret. Uh, and there she is. And the next lady is Mavis Beatty, or uh, using her maiden name, Lever. Now, Mavis was born in 1921 in East Dulwich. Uh, she was educated um, uh, in Newbury, Norbury, and then moved to a convent school in Croydon. Um, <clears throat> uh, she did well in learning German, and visits to Germany in 1930s helped her considerably in gaining a scholarship to the University, uh, University College London to study German. As she gained matriculation, I'm not sure what that was now, she was placed immediately into the second year of her university course. Um, and these visits to Germany as well also helped improve her, her, her linguist, linguistic skills in the language. <clears throat> um, now, at the beginning of the Second World War, Mavis decided to give up her studies at UCL because um, the college was moving to Wales and she wanted to do something for the war effort. She did think about nurse training, but was told to go to the forest office as she was a German language expert. And there from about the age of 18 or 19, she ended up um, at Bletchley Park. Now, just going back to um, um, the Abwa uh, Enigma, I just I'll say a little bit about that. Abwa was the German military intelligence service from 1920 to 1945. So this covered the Weimar period before the Nazi takeover in 1933. So Abwa worked for the Reichswehr, which was the name of the armed forces in Germany up to the Nazi period, when it changed to the Wehrmacht in 1935. Now, the Abwa used a range of cipher machines, uh, which I won't go into too much detail on because I haven't got the time. Um, but one of the um, machines was a, a, a type of enigma, um, and it, it, it had a, a kind of a, the basis of the um, machine was it uh, had a letter counter. Um, I'm not quite sure what that means personally, but um, that's that's how it's described here. <clears throat> um, now, on the 8th of December um, uh, 1941, um, Abwa Enigma uh, was decoded and read by um, um, uh, the, the Dilly's team, Mavis and Margaret, um, using the, the rodding technique that I previously mentioned. 
Now, this, uh, which I didn't say earlier, is a linguistic technique rather than a ma ma mathematical one. <clears throat> and Mavis was uh, able to ascertain the settings of one of the wheels, which was called the green wheel, after two days of intensive effort. Now, uh, Margaret also worked on this, and, and he um, and Knox attributed to the success of breaking the Abwa machine to both Margaret and to uh, Mavis. And when Dennis Deniston seemed skeptical, Knox told him, give me a lever and a rock and I will move the universe. So that's how highly, re how, um, highly re regarded they were in his eyes. Now, why was Abwar important? <clears throat> because it gave an advantage to Britain to plan um, the D-Day attack. By decoding the Abwa messages, they were able to understand what the Germans thought about reports from double agents in Britain, such as Garbo, about the Allied invasion on the Western Front in 1944. Uh, this operation called Double Cross was hugely successful and allowed the Allies to land in Normandy, Normandy as the Germans had been duped into believing that the Pays de Calais was the Allied target. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that in, 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 um, towards the end of this talk. Now, <coughs> Mavis also then went on, I don't know whether you can um, read this, but um, she then went on to help break the Italian, Italian enigma and help the Royal Navy secure a victory um, against the Italian Navy at the Battle of Matapan in March 1941. This came about as Mavis was working on her own, found that one very long message, there was a lesser missing. There were no L's. She thought that the operator had made a mistake, but in fact, she and a colleague were able to reconstruct how the wiring worked in, in the Italian machine. <clears throat> um, they also, the Italians also made a mistake by insisting that a full stop be inserted in a particular five letter sequence, which Mavis was then able to identify. And in March um, 1941, in a series of messages were decoded from Supermarina, the Italian High Naval Command. Um, she, after a few days, was able to work out um, uh, what the messages contained. And she was able to get her intelligence to the British, British Naval Command um, and this was, um, she had just made the first break into the traffic on the Italian wartime machine, which revealed their operational plans uh, before the battle had even taken place. And um, uh, the, the, uh, the British, the Royal Navy rather, was able to almost liquidate the Italian Navy as a result. So let's move on to the middle, the three people here, I'm, I'm going to be talking about two of them. Uh, the middle bloke um, is, um, I've already mentioned, um, uh, which is um, uh, Travis. And then on the right hand side is uh, John Tiltman, who I'm calling the forgotten genius of um, Bletchley Park. Uh, well, not just Bletchley Park, actually. He achieved a lot before Bletchley Park, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a second. <clears throat> now, he was born um, in 1894 in London. He came from a prosperous family, and he was sent to Charterhouse School, <coughs> um, which is a, a private school, uh, for those who don't know it. He excelled to such an extent that he was offered a place at Oxford University at the age of 13. But unfortunately, his father died, and this meant that the family were in reduced circumstances. So he was unable to take up the offer of a university uh, of the university place. But during World War One, he enlisted in the army and was wounded on the Somme. Um, and then he gained the military cross for services at the Battle of Arras, and he was wounded wounded again at that battle, which which had lifelong long effects after making his way back through no man's land to the safety of his lines. After World War I, he taught himself Russian and also went on a Russian course and went on to temporary attachment at the Government Code and Cipher School. <clears throat> now, um, at that time, just after World War I, Russia was the main focus of um, GC and CS activity. Um, 
And then in the 1930s, um, there was growing concern about J Japan, um, especially after they invaded uh, Manchuria. And he learned about Japanese writing. Now, these are the list of um, successes and achievements that John Tiltman had. Um, as you can see from the 1920s right through to um, uh, the Second World War. So, but I, I haven't got time to go through all of those because it would take up more than the time that's been allotted to me. <clears throat> um, so, excuse me, just to make, make sure I've got my, my notes in the right order. And I haven't. <laughs> Sorry. I need to go on to talk about the this machine which was probably the most difficult machine of them all. <laughs> um, now, the, the Lorenz, this Lorenz machine used teleprinter um, activity, uh, technology rather than Morse code. <clears throat> um, and um, basically the um, it had, as, as I was mentioning, Enigma had three or four roses. This machine had uh, 12 roses. So it's hugely, hugely complex. And the reason why um, it used uh, teleprinter technology was because Morse code was limited in terms of the length of messages. And uh, it was used by the German high command uh, who needed to send very long messages securely. Um, and um, in, in the, the Lorenz machine had a huge number of possible start positions. Um, in fact, um, my notes tell me here it was 1.6 million billion uh, possible combinations. Um, so that's how, how complex it was. <clears throat> now, as a result of that, um, the Lorenz encrypted communications were thought to be unbreakable. Um, and um, But a human error led to the breakthrough of the crack code. Incidentally, I should just say that um, people who were listening for Morse code messages um, on, uh, on the, li and, and listening stations, uh, there was a different signal uh, when using teleprinter machines. That's uh, 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 important to, to mention that. Now, the, the thing that um, uh, helped break this code was a, a human error <clears throat> by, by the Germans, or two German um, um, army uh, people. Um, on the 30th of August, 1941, um, Against all the rules, a Lorenz message was resent between Berlin and Athens because the first was not received properly. They used the same wheel, wheel, wheel settings, which was another um, uh, thing that shouldn't have happened. And, and crucially, the second message was shortened by the use of abbreviations. And this gave um, Tiltman the insights he needed to break the code by hand, which he did in 10 days. But this contained a sequence of obscuring characters. Um, so he asked Bill Tutt, who I'll come on to in a moment, um, to try and understand the nature of, of these characters. And, and what Bill Tutt uh, did was he started to write out the, bit, the patterns from each of the five channels in the teleprinter form of the, of the string of obscuring characters at various repeating repetition periods. <clears throat> and he had to write, he, he did this by hand. And when he wrote out the bit patterns from uh, one channel on a repetition of 41, various patterns began to emerge, which were more than random. This showed that a repetition period of 41 had some significance in the way the cipher was generated. <clears throat> then over the next two months, Tut and other members of the research section worked out the complete logical structure of the cipher machine, which we now know as Lorenz. 
which was um, a fantastic tour of force. Now, just a little bit about um, Bill Tutt. He was born in 1917 uh, in Newmarket in Suffolk. <clears throat> um, in 1935, he won a scholarship to study natural sciences at Trinity College, Cambridge, where he specialized in chemistry and graduated with first class honors in 1938. He continued with physical chemistry as a graduate student, but uh, transferred to mathematics at the end of 1940. Um, Tut's uh, tutor, Patrick, suggested him for war work at gov the government code and cipher school at Bletchley Park. Um, he was interviewed and sent on a training course in London before going to, on to Bletchley Park, where he joined the research section. And it was this uh, in the research section uh, in which he did this work, which helped analyze. Now, <clears throat> I, I don't know whether you can see this, but um, effectively, um, he uh, worked out on paper without ever seeing the machine, how the, the makeup of the, the number of rotors um, and um, um the, which were in two series of fives and two what were two two management rotors as they were called <clears throat> and this enabled um a further breakthrough in terms of developing a new machine which uh was called the tunny now the tunny was the name given by the british to lo the lorenz machine itself and at the beginning of 1942 um, um, uh, the post office research laboratories at Dollis Hill were asked to produce an, um, an, an implementation of the logic worked out by Bill Tutt and his team. And a guy called Frank, Frank Morrill produced a rack of uniselectors and relays in which emulated the logic of the Lorenz machine. And this was called the Tunny, which you can see a picture of here. <clears throat> Um, and uh, a, a new uh, setup in Bletchley Park was um, uh, established, uh, known as the Testery, and this was um, uh, the name was uh, after the guy who led the unit called Ralph Tester. And th this group, the Testery, um, used hand methods to break um the um messages from lorenz and they decoded one and a half million messages by hand within one year of its foundation <clears throat> um and starting with a, a a small number of people uh, the testery had grown to nine cryptographers and a total staff of 180 118 um in 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 three shifts but the decryption of messages by the test tree was, uh, was, was astonishing. And um, what, what they did was that um, they, um, uh, <coughs> um, the manual code breakers, uh, when they worked out a particular message, these settings were then plugged into the tunny and the cipher text uh, was put in. And if, the, if they'd got it right, it came out in German, which went, then went off to the translators. Um, so a huge uh, improvement. And by the end of the war, there were about 12 or 15 tunny machines um, at, at, at Bletchley Park. But um, the hand method was um, limiting. And um, in fact, the, there were possibly three phases of uh, and, uh, decoding Lorenz messages. Um, the test re, um did, did it by hand, as I say, from July 1942 to 1943. And, and then um, from 43 to 44, there was a machine which was uh, nicknamed Heath Robertson. And then from 44 to 45, um, Colossus. And I'm going to come on to those now. But before I do, I just need to talk about this man, um, Max Newman. Um, 
and he was born in London as well. He won a scholarship uh, to study mathematics at St. John's College, Cambridge. Um, and um, in um, he, he, his studies were, were interrupted um, for, for a period um, uh, due to um, due to the war, and um, <clears throat> and he was assigned to the same research section that uh, Bill Tutt was in, um, and he originally joined the testery, but he didn't like the work, and he persuaded his superiors that um, Tutt's methods. Uh, could be mechanized and he was assigned to develop a suitable machine in December 1942 uh, <clears throat> and um, this then meant that a new section was developed called the Newmanry uh, which um, was set up specifically to, to, to help uh, build machines um, <clears throat> and um, he then uh, was introduced to um, by one Alan Turing to this man, Tommy Flowers. I'll just say a little bit about him before I go on to the machines themselves. Um, and I'm conscious of the time here, so I'm gonna to have to move pretty qu quickly. Um, now, um, he, Flowers was an apprentice uh, in mechanical engineering at the Royal Arsenal in Woolwich. Uh, it's, incidentally, he was born in 1905. And he, but he took evening classes at the University of London to earn a degree in electrical engineering. And he joined the telecommunications branch of the general post office um, um, before, mo before moving to the research station, post office research station at, at uh, Dollis Hill in 1930. <clears throat> um, now in, Flowers' first contact with code breaking came in February 1941 when his director uh, was asked for help by Alan Turing. And um, Turing wanted um, Flowers to build a counter for the relay based bomb machine, um, but uh, that was abandoned. And as I say, he introduced him to Newman. And he and uh, Frank Morrell, who I've already mentioned, designed the Heath Robinson, which you can see here. Um, now, this was an early attempt at uh, automating code breaking, um, and um, it was it was um, given the name um, Heath Robinson um, after the illustrator um, because he um, did very complicated drawings of um, of, of machinery. Um, um, and, but it was, it was quite, um, a difficult machine. It, it kept breaking down. It wasn't that reliable. And Tommy Flowers, um, was asked if he could improve upon the Heath Robinson. Uh, but rather than modify it, he proposed the development of Colossus, uh, to overcome the limitations of, of Heath Robinson. Um, and, um, what uh, Flowers wanted to do was to use um, fla um, a huge number of valves in developing um, thermionic valves as they, or vacuum tubes as they were. Um, and I shall show you a picture of the valves in a, in a moment. But the number of valves that Flowers proposed was 1,800. Um, and having... Um, of having only one paper tape instead of two that um, you can see on the Heath Robinson here. <clears throat> but um, the most complicated machines, electronic machines, only used about 150 valves, and Bletchley Park management were sceptical, um, <clears throat> and um, they weren't convinced and just basically uh, said no. Um, but... Um, Flowers used some of his own money to start building it. Um, but then he got backing for his project from the director of the post office research station. Um, and they developed um, the, the first machine in about 11 months. And this is a picture which doesn't do itself to do justice to it, because if you can look at 
this is one of three rows of valves that were used um, uh, to develop Colossus. Um, and it, it operated five times faster and was more flexible than the Heath Robinson. <clears throat> um, it was delivered to Bletchley Park in January 1944, where it was assembled and began to operate in early February. Um, and um, the algorithms used by Colossus were developed by Bill Tuss, of course. <clears throat> um, and Colossus proved to be efficient and quick against the 12 Rosa Lorenz machine. In, an, in anticipation of the need for more computers, Flowers already started, was already working on Mark II, which employed two and a half thousand or 2,400 valves to be precise. And this went on, uh, serve, went into service at Bletchley Park on the 1st of June, 1944, and immediately produced vital information for the imminent D-Day landings planned for Monday, the 5th of June, which was, as we know, postponed due to by, by bad weather by 24 hours. <clears throat> um, Flowers later described a crucial meeting between Eisenhower and his staff on the 5th of June, during which a courier entered and handed Eisenhower a note summarizing a Colossus decrypt. This confirmed that Hitler wanted no additional troops moved to Normandy, as he was still convinced that the preparations for the Normandy landings were a feint. Handing back, to de the, handing back the decrypt, Eisenhower announced to his staff, we go tomorrow. <coughs> Earlier, a report from Rommel uh, uh, on the Western defences was decoded by Colossus and revealed that one of the sites chosen as the drop for a U.S. parachute division was the base for a German tank division, so the, the landing site was changed. Now, the, the amazing work that Flowers and his team did was not recognised until the 1970s. All Flowers' family knew was that he had done some secret and important work. And that was true for Bill Tutt and all the others um, that I, I've mentioned as well. And just to sum up in terms of achievements, <clears throat> um, a crypto a crypt analyst from the US Army Signal Corps, who was seconded to Bletchley Park and worked on uh, Tunney as well, um, reported back to his bosses that the daily solutions of um, uh, fish messages or Lorenz messages um, at um, Bletchley Park reflect a background of British mathematical genius, superb engineering ability and solid, solid common sense. Each of these has been a necessary factor. Each could have been overemphasized or underemphasized under to the detriment of the solutions. A remarkable fact is that the fusion of the elements has been apparently in perfect proportion. The result is an outstanding contribution to crypto crypt analytic science. Now, <clears throat> uh, just to finish um, that, I've just listed a few biographies here. I haven't listed any biographies of Alan Turing, but uh, because I'm sure there are uh, quite a few of those, but I just thought I would highlight uh, these biographies of Gordon Welshman, Mavis Beatty, Mavis Lever that I've been talking about, and the forgotten giant of Bletchley Park, John Tiltman. And I would recommend, if you are seriously interested in this subject, of visiting Bletchley Park. The National Museum of Computing at Bletch on Bletchley Park is on the site, but it's a separate museum, and you have to pay separately, I'm afraid. But the Museum of Computing houses the reconstructed bomb and reconstructed um, Colossus machines, and it's, it's, it's well worth a visit. And you can actually see a tunny machine and a Lorenz machine that was um, captured in 1945, um, and that's on display there as well. And the staff will can give you a run through of the contributions that the people I've been talking about made, um, perhaps in a little bit more detail than I have done. And finally, um, I shall be coming back to this subject um, on the 19th of April, uh, when I shall be talking about how the messages got to Bletchley Park in the first place, and talk about the roles of women in all of these places. 
Um, and that concludes my talk. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm sorry if that got really complicated, but um, there was a lot to get through. And um, some of the technical stuff is, uh, as I say, extremely uh, complex and uh, way beyond me as well, I'm afraid. I'm a historian, not a mathematician or a scientist. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike. Um, that, that was fascinating, um, really fascinating. And I think I just about managed to keep up by my fingertips. Um, there's now an opportunity for um, to open up for anybody who's got any questions or comments, if you'd like to post them in the comment box. Um, I see we've got one of your listeners, Mike, Sarah Helen Snow. Her grandfather was at one of the listening stations that passed messages on to Bletchley um, in St. Earth, Cornwall. So um, I hope, Sarah Helen, you'll be joining Mike for part four of his talk where he talks about the listeners. And that will be on the 19th of April. Um, as I said, if, if anybody's got any questions, please feel free to post a comment. Um, while you're doing that, I'd also like to mention, as well as Mike's next talk on the 19th of April, the next History Indoors talk is on Wednesday, the 8th of March at 7 p.m. And Tim Gooch is going to be talking about Athelfade, Lady of Mercia, the eldest child of Alfred the Great. So um, I don't think there'll be any mathematics there. OK, um, I see Mike, Sarah Helen says that she's put April the 19th in her calendar. So many thanks for that. Um, while we're waiting for questions, I thought I'd take the um, chair's privilege and ask you one myself. Um, you, your talk seems to imply that the Lorenz machine and the work on the breaking the Lorenz code was the best and most important work that Bletchley Park undertook. And yet in the myth, if you like, or the story that of Bletchley Park that most of us are aware of, Turing is the great genius. And yet in your talk, we didn't see Turing in relation to Lorenz. Did he play a part? Um, thanks for that, Josh. Yeah, well, in fact, he did. Um, he actually helped um, Tut um, uh, in, in a sense, because um, in July 1942, Turing was um, um, uh, seconded to the research section um, that Bill Tut was in. And he worked out... Um, Again, this is a, a fairly technical, the values of successive characters in a stream of ciphertext. And um, he uh, emphasized that um, uh, departure, any departures from a uniform distribution, um, and this was called the difference. Um, so I, I could go into more detail here, but um, this then um allowed to to exploit um amp the ampl amplification of non-uniformity in the different values um and by november of that year had produced a way of discovering wheel starting points of the lorenz machine so um turing work gave uh, tut a clue if in a way uh, for the brief period that he was in in the research section. But Tut's genius was to go on and work out the complexity of the Lorenz machine itself without ever seeing it. So if you go back to my very poor photograph, sorry, this one here, you can see, although there's a light, because there was glass in front of this, so you're getting a reflection, you can see five rotors and then another five here and two here and he worked out the positions um uh, of these rotors 
um, uh, statistically and mathematically without ever seeing the machine. And if you remember that, uh, well, perhaps you don't uh, don't remember, but in with Enigma, uh, machines were uh, were obtained, so it was it was possible to examine machi the machines as well um, uh, during the Second World War, whereas we um, nobody had see did uh, nobody got to see the Lorenz machine um, until the end of the war. Now. As I said, it was used by the German High Command, and uh, one of the um, major successes, quite apart from the D-Day um, um, example I gave, was that the, that um, the code breakers were able to work out the German battle plans for the Battle of Kursk um, in Russia in 1943, and gave those battle plans to Stalin. Um, and he was able to deploy his forces successfully to defeat the Germans in that battle. Sorry, I can't hear you. No, yes, yeah, sorry, I was, I was having trouble with my uh, with my my mute button. That that's fascinating. And that last point about Kirk's, I. Kirks, the Battle of Kursk, I wasn't aware of. Um, we've had some comments. Um, Maggie Hall says this is a fantastic talk. Um, and Dan mentions, don't forget the part the Poles played in Cracking the Enigma. And I say to Dan, you've got to, if you haven't already, um, check out Mike's second talk, which deals with the international aspect of code breaking, and you spend a lot of time talking about the polls. Dan also mentions that there's a great exhibition in Poznan concerning that. So, um, unfortunately, unlike, unlike Bletchley Park, you can't get a Thames Link train to Poznan. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other maybe final question um i'd i'd like to ask um mike before we um call it a, a, an evening is on one of your slides there were three men um there was edward travis john tiltman and then a man in a trench coat looking maybe a little bit like um michael kane in the ipcrest file <laughs> and i just wondered who who's he it's not michael kane i can tell you that um but um yeah i agree he does look a bit like that doesn't he his name is harry hinsley and uh, he was a historian uh, and also a cryptanalyst as well um and um he um um did a lot of traffic analysis as well. Um, um, but one of the things he probably um, should be recognized for is he helped initiate a program of, se of seizing Enigma machines, as I've just mentioned, um, and keys from German weather ships. Um, and um, uh, he realized that the ships were on station for long periods and they would have to carry code books. Um, and um, <coughs> And this assumption proved correct. Um, and he also liaised with the US Navy in Washington um, uh, with the result that an agreement was reached in January 1944 to co cooperate in the exchange of results on Japanese naval signals. So just a, a very bit about him. He was born in 1918. Um, and surprise, surprise, he also went to Cambridge. Mm. I think practically everybody I've talked about today, apart from the two ladies, went to Cambridge. Um, although John Tiltman didn't, actually, and neither did Dilly Knox, um, but uh, all the other characters did. And I, I should add that I have not mentioned uh, anything like the number of people um, that were important. Frank Birch, Hugh Alexander, Peter Twin, um, uh, Jack Good, Hugh Foss, uh, Sean Wiley, 
I, I could have, you know, spent hours and hours and hours, um, and it was already complicated enough. Mike, we've got a question from Peter McLaren, and he says, can you comment on why it took so many years to eventually declassify the work at Bletchley Park? He says, um, I attended post office telephones management training course at Bletchley in the early 1970s. The Special Secrets Act in in um, three words. Um, and um, the way Bletchley worked was incredible because they all worked in silos. So nobody knew, um, with the, even within Bletchley Park, what other people were up to. And... Um, uh the secrecy surrounding it all was um incredible and um slowly but surely things started to emerge in in the 1970s as a result i think of the 30 year rule um when uh, secret papers were were released um and um and so Colossus, uh, which was the world's first semi-programmable computer, um, was uh, no, nobody knew it, it was really the first computer to be developed in the world um, because the United States uh, scientists uh, said that they had developed the first computer. But in fact, the first one was Colossus. The bomb, incidentally, uh, was more a calculating machine rather than a computer. <clears throat> so I'm told. But I, I wouldn't like to get into an, an argument about that. But all I can say is, in terms of secrecy, was um, um, people were told, um, you know, all kinds of horror stories, I think, about, you know, what would happen to them if they if they started to break secrets. Um, and so they they didn't tell anybody, even members of their own family. And as I say, all the, it, the Tommy Flowers knew, the family knew, was that he was working on something secret. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that that's borne out by another comment from Sarah Helen, who says, "My grandfather retired in 1967. He never talked about what he did." Yeah. Um, as somebody once said, don't mention the war. Yeah. <laughs> OK, um, I think on that note, I think I'll draw things to a close. Um, thanks again, Mike, for an excellent talk. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Um, as I've mentioned, Mike's next talk is April the 19th. And that will be on the listeners the y stations and the role of women or the roles of women i should say um history indoors next talk is on march the 8th and that's about apple fade lady of mercia and you can catch up with any of this talk if you've missed any of it or catch up with any of our other talks by just going onto our youtube channel history indoors and you can also find us on the website and the normal social media um things so um thanks very much for listening in um enjoy your evenings and um we'll see you hopefully in april yeah goodbye everybody thank you for listening and coming